Hi, my name is Professor Fink, and this is the second video for the RDHAP uh, program uh, in this series covering a review of uh, drugs uh, commonly taken by your patients uh, for uh, their underlying chronic diseases and disorders. Uh, this uh, video is focusing on autonomic drugs, and our first thought might be, well, what are those? Uh, why do I have to know anything about th those drugs? Autonomic drugs are drugs that either mimic or block uh, the autonomic nervous system's actions uh, on the various internal organs of the body. These autonomic drugs are very commonly applied or used uh, to manage cardiovascular problems and respiratory problems, as well as others. So uh, in this very uh, short review, uh, we're going to very quickly review the autonomic nervous system and how these autonomic drugs uh, work. So uh, we're going to just uh, uh, scroll down and you might want to uh, uh, print, print out these uh, uh, lecture outline uh, just to uh, have something to study from. Okay, so uh, on uh, our first page of, uh, of this uh, lecture outline, uh, we see the so-called autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system uh, consists of those autonomic motor neurons that innervate and control essentially all the internal organs of the body. Everything ranging from the tear glands uh, to the salivary glands to the heart, uh, the airways of the lungs, uh, the digestive tract, uh, the kidneys, uh, the urinary bladder, and the genitalia. On uh, page two, we see the autonomic innervation of the heart, which is typical of all the other internal organs of the body. Uh, innervating the heart and other internal organs is both a parasympathetic and a sympathetic autonomic motor neuron or neural pathway. Uh, the parasympathetic neurons control, normally control the internal organs during what's known as the rest and digest state. So they basically control, cause uh, your internal organs such as your heart to slow down and cause increased salivation and gastrointestinal activity uh, in this uh, rest and digest state, such as when you're sitting down and leisurely having a meal. Uh, you'll notice that the parasympathetic autonomic motor neurons release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine onto the heart and onto the other internal organs. And then that acetylcholine then activates what are called muscarinic acetylcholine receptor sites that are on the cells of the heart as well as the other internal organs. Now, we're going to be learning that there are drugs that can mimic the parasympathetic effects on the heart and other internal organs by simply attaching and activating those muscarinic acetylcholine receptor sites, just like acetylcholine does. And so uh, by doing that, they mimic or cause what's called a parasympathetic state of the body. We'll develop that more in a moment. Now you'll notice that the internal organs like the heart are also innervated by sympathetic motor neurons. Uh, and the sympathetic autonomic motor neurons are activated during states of stress. So stress includes obviously whenever you're emotionally stressed, when you are physically stressing your body, such as exercising or uh, working. Uh, so uh, this uh, activates the sympathetic control of our heart and internal organs Notice that the sympathetic motor neurons release the neurotransmitter norepinephrine and also epinephrine. Norepinephrine and epinephrine are also called noradrenaline and adrenaline, and they activate what are called adrenergic receptor sites on the heart and the other visceral organs. Again, we have drugs that can mimic the action of uh, the sympathetic motor neurons by simply attaching and activating those adrenergic receptor sites that norepinephrine and epinephrine normally would activate. We're also going to see that there are drugs that can block uh, the parasympathetic or sympathetic uh, actions. 
by simply, uh, these drugs simply attach to these receptor sites and temporarily block them so uh, that these are called blockers or uh, lytic drugs. Okay, so to summarize, we have both parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation of our internal organs. The parasympathetics put our internal organs in a rest and digest state. The sympathetic autonomic motor neurons put our internal organs in the stress state. And in the stress state, our heart rate speeds up and our blood pressure rises and our airways dilate. Uh, but uh, there's actually a decrease in salivation and GI motility. Let's move to uh, scroll down to the third page. In the third page uh, is a chart. And it may look scary, but it's not so bad. Uh, uh, what we've got is two sides to this chart. Let's start with the right side. The right side basically describes what happens to our internal organs in the stress state. This is, uh, again, activated by our sympathetic autonomic motor neurons, which release norepinephrine and epinephrine uh, into our body. Uh, they, norepinephrine and epinephrine happen to also be known as catecholamine neurotransmitters. That's just a generic term for both norepinephrine and epinephrine. And uh, we've said that they activate these adrenergic receptor sites on the visceral organs. So all of these words really mean the same thing. Stress, sympathetic. It's easy to remember sympathetic and stress. Stress both start with the letter S. Uh, adrenergic, adrenaline. Uh, catecholamines, all of these refer to the same thing. Now, when our body goes is in a stress state, when we are stressed, the main way we deal with stress is we need increased amounts of energy. And that involves increasing the production of ATP by breaking down sugars and fats and other foods in our body with oxygen at a faster rate to produce uh, this energy. So the sympathetic autonomic motor neurons and the sympathomimetic drugs that mimic their action uh, cause glycogenolysis in the liver. That just means the conversion of glycogen into sugar and the release of that sugar into the bloodstream, raising the blood sugar level. Uh, that's called hyperglycemia. That helps us produce more energy during stress. Similar thing happens in our fat cells. Uh, the fat in our fat cells is broken apart into fatty acids and released into our bloodstream, raising and making more available uh, fats uh, for energy. Uh, our airways dilate uh, to facilitate taking in more oxygen so that we can break down those sugars and fats at a fast, fast rate for energy. There is a drying out of our nasal and bronchial passages, a decrease in bronchial secretions. Uh, there is an increase in heart rate and force of contraction. And when the heart beats faster, called tachycardia, and more powerfully, it increases cardiac output. Now you'll notice that I actually have a beta one listed here. We're going to see it very shortly that the adrenergic receptor sites on the heart are specifically called beta one adrenergic receptors. You'll notice that just above uh, for the airways uh, bronchodilation, I wrote beta two. Those are a different type of adrenergic receptor site. We'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, the sympathetic autonomic motor neurons in a stress state dilate the blood vessels to our heart and skeletal muscle, increasing blood flow to them. And at the very same time, the sympathetic autonomic motor neurons and sympathetic drugs that, that mimic their action constrict the blood vessels everywhere else in the body, including the GI tract and kidneys, reducing blood flow and, uh, to those organs. So you can see that in a stress state, blood is being diverted uh, from, away from our GI tract and kidneys and being directed, increased, uh, to provide more blood flow to our heart and skeletal muscles. Uh, during a stress state, our blood pressure rises, our pupils dilate, which is called medriasis, our mouth goes dry just as there's a decrease in bronchial secretions, there's a decrease in salivary secretions, there's a decrease in GI motility. In other words, when you're in a stress state, your body stops digesting its meal because it has more important things to worry about. When you're finished with the stress state, when you've finished with your exercise and can sit back and relax, then the body will revert to the parasympathetic rest and digest mode. Uh, the uh, uh, sympathetics uh, cause urinary retention, 
they tend to decrease uh, urination. Uh, so those are among some of the actions caused by the stress state. So it's very useful to have a handle on this to kind of feel, uh, understand what happens to our internal organs of our body when we're stressed, because we're going to see that when we give a patient a sympathomimetic drug, an adrenergic drug, it's going to produce generally these actions on the body. So again, this occurs during exercise and other stress states. Now on page four, uh, on the other column, it summarizes what the parasympathetic autonomic motor neurons do. Remember, they control our internal organs when we're eating uh, in the rest and digest state. Uh, they do that by releasing a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which activates the so-called muscarinic acetylcholine or cholinergic receptor sites. So all of these terms pretty much mean the same thing. Rest and digest, parasympathetic, uh, uh, cholinergic, all relates to this rest and digest state. When we're at rest, when we're relaxing, uh, the, uh, our energy demands are lower. Uh, we don't have high energy demands. We're not running uh, 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 and uh, lifting weights or, uh, uh, or picking up objects. Uh, and uh, the, uh, when we eat a meal, uh, the foods, the nutrients that we're absorbing uh, from our digestive tract are going to be stored. And so the sugars are stored in the liver. Uh, that's called glycogenesis as they're converted into glycogen. The fats in our meal and our food are stored in our fat cells. Our airways tend to constrict. There is an increase in bronchial secretions. The heart rate slows down. That's called bradycardia. And overall cardiac output, the rate at which blood is flowing through the body slows down. That was in contrast to an increase in cardiac output during stress. Notice how the flow of blood is just the reverse of the stress state. When we're relaxed, there's generalized vasodilation of blood vessels uh, to our GI tract and kidneys, increasing blood flow there. But the blood vessels to our heart and skeletal muscle, they actually constrict, reducing blood flow to our heart and skeletal muscles when we're just resting. Overall, our blood pressure decreases, our pupils constrict, uh, but uh, just like uh, because we're eating a meal, the parasympathetic autonomic motor neurons increase salivation and increase GI motility, as, as well as promoting emptying of the bladder. Those are among some of the effects of, on our internal organs in the relaxed rest and digest state. Okay, moving on uh, to uh, page five. So there is a class of autonomic drugs that are called sympathomimetics. The word mimetic means to mimic, to copy. The way these drugs work is they activate those adrenergic receptor sites on the heart and other visceral organs, just like the norepinephrine and epinephrine do. So uh, we wrote here that these drugs simply activate those adrenergic receptor sites on the heart. Now I have mentioned that the adrenergic receptor sites on the heart happen to be called beta-1 adrenergic receptor sites. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. Okay, as I scroll down, so if we give somebody a sympathomimetic or adrenergic drug, uh, it's going to cause, in general, these sympathetic effects on the body, these stress effects that occur in the body. They're, uh, they're going to, uh, there's going to be a rise in their blood sugar level, their airways are going to dilate, their heart rate is going to speed up, their blood pressure is going to rise, and so on. Now, a second class of autonomic drugs are called parasympathomimetics. They mimic the action of the parasympathetic autonomic motor neurons by activating those uh, acetylcholine receptor sites uh, on the heart and other visceral organs, so they're called cholinergic agonists. An agonist is simply a drug that activates a receptor site. So there are adrenergic agonists that activate adrenergic receptor sites and cholinergic agonists that activate acetylcholine or cholinergic receptor sites. So in our picture, uh, we have drugs that activate these muscarinic acetylcholine receptor sites, mimicking the parasympathetic effects the rest and digest state on the body. That's what we can see on page eight. So if we give a parasympathomimetic drug, it causes the visceral organs of our body to basically go into this rest and digest state. 
where uh, the uh, uh, the uh, blood sugar level goes down uh, and our airways tend to constrict. Uh, there is a, a slowing down of our heart rate uh, and uh, the blood flow to our heart and skeletal muscles decreases. And at the same time, the blood vessels uh, to uh, our GI tract and kidneys dilate, increasing blood flow, our overall blood pressure goes down. Uh, and because they're mimicking this rest and digest state, they tend to cause increased salivation and increased GI motility. A third class of autonomic drugs are drugs that block the sympathetic effects on the body. They are called sympatholytics. The suffix ending lytic means to stop, to break, to block. And so these drugs are blocking the sympathetic effects on our body. How? By blocking those adrenergic receptor sites. That's why they're also called adrenergic blockers. So in our picture, these drugs simply block those adrenergic receptor sites. I drew two lines to indicate that we're blocking those receptor sites rather than activating them. Now, if we have a drug uh, and these, and you remember that we said that the adrenergic receptor sites on the heart are actually called beta-1 adrenergic receptor sites. So it, we have drugs that can just block those beta-1 adrenergic receptor sites and not the other adrenergic receptor sites throughout our body. They would be called beta-1 blockers or beta-1 adrenergic blockers. We'll have more to say about those in the cardiovascular drug review. When we block the adrenergic receptor sites on the heart, that means that by default, the only neural influence, the only effect the nervous system can have on the heart is the parasympathetic effect. So basically, when we block uh, the adrenergic receptor sites, whether it's only on the heart or everywhere in the body, then by default, only the parasympathetic influence can happen. So by blocking the adrenergic receptor sites, and if we did that everywhere in the body, uh, that's called a sympatholytic drug. And the result, as I drew on page 10, is by blocking any sympathetic effects on our internal organs, by default, the only influence on our internal organs is the parasympathetic, so the body goes into the parasympathetic state. So the body is going to go into this rest and digest state. Now, an obvious question that students always ask is, well, if you simply block the sympathetic and the body goes into the parasympathetic mode, isn't that essentially identical to giving a parasympathomimetic drug to begin with? And the answer is yes, you're absolutely right. We can create a parasympathetic rest and digest state by either giving a drug that activates the parasympathetic, uh, 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 the, uh, 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 mimics the parasympathetic state, or giving a drug that blocks the sympathetic effect. So, if, however, having said that, clinicians tend to prefer using blockers than mimetics. So, while we do use mimetic drugs, we more commonly use drugs that block these uh, adrenergic uh, receptors or block the cholinergic and by default get the opposite effects on the body, that's more commonly done than giving mimetics. It seems to cause less trauma or stress to the body. The fourth and last category, so this isn't gonna go on forever, the fourth and final category of autonomic drugs are parasympatholytics. Remember the suffix ending lytic means to stop, to block, to break. We're blocking the parasympathetic action. How? These are drugs that attach and block the acetylcholine receptor sites on the heart and other visceral organs. In our picture, so we have drugs that can block, and I drew two lines here to represent that we're blocking those muscarinic acetylcholine receptor sites. Therefore, the parasympathetic autonomic motor neurons cannot exert any effect on the heart. And by default, the only influence on the heart in this example is the sympathetic effect by releasing norepinephrine, which can activate the adrenergic receptor sites. So when we block the 
uh, when we block the parasympathetic effects from occurring, by default, the body goes into the sympathetic stress mode. So on page 12 uh, in this chart, by using a parasympatholytic drug, a drug that blocks the parasympathetic effects by blocking those acetylcholine receptor sites on the heart and other visceral organs, by default, the body goes into the sympathetic stress mode. And again, you might ask, isn't that the same as just giving a sympathomimetic, an adrenergic agonist, which would also cause this sympathetic effect? And to respond, you are absolutely correct. It is the same effect. We get the same uh, result. So, however, uh, again, clinicians tend to prefer giving blockers rather than memetics. Okay, on page 13, on page 13, I want to very quickly walk you through this uh, kind of flowchart diagram that I've created to help us better understand things uh, a little bit more. So um, basically what we've uh, I've done in this picture is we kind of show that the body can go into the parasympathetic rest and digest state, uh, or it can go into the sympathetic stress state. Obviously, if you're eating a meal, you're in this rest and digest state. If you are exercising or uh, highly stressed, uh, then you're in the sympathetic stress state. Uh, we know that we have drugs that can mimic the parasympathetic state. We have drugs that can mimic the sympathetic. Among the drugs that mimic the sympathetic actions by activating those adrenergic receptor sites include not only epinephrine, which is uh, also known as adrenaline, but also the drugs ephedrine and, uh, and uh, amphetamine. All of these drugs mimic the sympathetic or stress state. So if somebody takes amphetamine, and if you're not sure what amphetamine is, you've all heard of methamphetamine or speed. Why is it called speed, crystal meth, methamphetamine? It's like being on heavy duty adrenaline. You are wired. Your heart pounds, beats very quickly. Your blood pressure rises. Your pupils are dilated. Uh, your blood sugar uh, level rises and you are stimulated and very alert and uh, uh, awake very opposite of in, being in the rest and digest state. Remember, we also have drugs that can block the parasympathetic, and one of the more important uh, drugs that's commonly referred to in pharmacology is atropine. Atropine is a parasympatholytic. It blocks the parasympathetic effects, so by default, the body goes into the sympathetic uh, or stress mode. Now, uh, in terms of the adrenergic receptors, the, we might learn that the adrenergic receptor sites on the different visceral organs of the body are not all the same. They fall into two major categories or subtypes, alpha adrenergic receptors and beta adrenergic receptors. The alpha adrenergic receptors are in the, associated with the eyes and most blood vessels. What that means is that if a drug activates only the alpha adrenergic receptors, it basically creates the sympathetic stress effects only on the eyes, meaning the pupils dilate, and on most blood vessels, causing them to constrict. Uh, the uh, beta adrenergic receptor sites are everywhere else in the body. They're in the heart. They're in the airways of the lungs. They're in the liver. Uh, they're in the GI tract. So uh, they're everywhere else. We, if you have a drug that activates all of the beta adrenergic receptors, it means that it would cause all the sympathetic or stress effects on the body, except it would not cause the sympathetic stress effects on the eyes or most blood vessels, uh, because it does uh, it, a beta adrenergic drug only activates the beta. And of course, we have drugs that are blockers. They can just block alpha adrenergic receptors, just preventing these effects, these sympathetic effects, and these, therefore, the eyes and most blood vessels will go into the parasympathetic rest and digest mode. And we have beta blockers. Beta blockers block uh, the uh, beta adrenergic receptor sites, which would block the sympathetic stress effects on most uh, internal organs of the body. Okay, and finally, 
There are different types of beta adrenergic receptors. In fact, books talk about beta-1 and beta-2 and beta-3 and others, but we're just going to focus on the beta-1 and beta-2. The beta-1 adrenergic receptors are essentially located on the heart. We have drugs that can activate just the beta-1 adrenergic receptors, causing the sympathetic stress effects only on the heart, causing the heart rate to speed up, increasing cardiac output, raising the blood pressure. Uh, we also have drugs that can block only the beta-1 adrenergic receptor sites, preventing the heart from speeding up. That would mean that the heart cannot speed up, uh, and by default, the heart goes into the parasympathetic relax mode of bradycardia and decreased cardiac output. We also have drugs that can activate just the beta-2 adrenergic receptors, which are primarily, not exclusively but primarily located in the bronchial, uh, bronchial airways and by using a drug that activates only the beta-2 adrenergic receptor sites on the <coughs> airways of the lungs, <coughs> it causes that sympathetic effect on the airways where the airways dilate. <coughs> there, there's also drugs that could block the beta-2 adrenergic receptor sites. All right, so what we've laid out for you, therefore, is the following. First, before I summarize this chart one last time, let's just uh, look right here. You'll notice that on the chart, uh, we indicated uh, that the beta-1 adrenergic receptors are associated with the heart, and uh, the beta-2 are associated with the airways. Uh, and so those happen to be very important. Uh, look, so summarizing the chart. We have sympathomimetic drugs that cause the entire sympathetic stress effect on the body. We also have drugs that can just activate only the alpha adrenergic receptors or just the beta, or only just the beta-1 or beta-2. So a beta-1 adrenergic agonist would only cause the heart to speed up. That's the only sympathetic stress effect it would have on the body. A beta-2 adrenergic agonist drug would only cause airways to dilate, essentially. That's the only sympathetic effect, stress effect it would have on the body. And finally, we have beta-1 blockers that would block or prevent the heart from speeding up. And so by default, the body would go, the heart would slow down and the cardiac output and blood pressure would go down. <coughs> Let's <clears throat> Pardon me. Let's apply this knowledge. What I've done is I've reproduced from the LexiComp drug information book uh, a drug that we've looked up called albuterol. Some of you may already be familiar with albuterol. It is one of the top 10 most prescribed drugs in the United States. It goes under, that's albuterol is its generic name. Uh, it goes under brand name Provento and Ventolin and others. And what's its pharmacologic category? Look at that, it is a beta-2 adrenergic agonist. That means it activates only the beta-2 adrenergic receptor sites on those airways and mimicking the sympathetic stress effect only on the airways, it dilates the airways. Therefore, it is used as a bronchodilator for asthma, <clears throat> and other chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases like bro chronic bronchitis and, and so on. So in fact, we're going to see that the most common medications that are used for people who have asthma are bronchodilators, specifically beta-2 adrenergic agonists. As I scroll down to page 15, here's another drug we've looked up. It's called atenolol. Atenolol goes under the brand name Tenorman. It is also in the top 10 most prescribed drugs in the United States. Its pharmacologic category is it's a beta blocker, more precisely a beta-1 selective blocker. It blocks the beta-1 adrenergic receptor sites on the heart, preventing the heart from speeding up. So the heart rate slows down, it causes bradycardia, and it lowers cardiac output and, uh, and lowers blood pressure. This drug is used in the treatment of hypertension, either alone or in combination with other agents. 
because by slowing down the heart rate and other effects, it lowers the blood pressure. It's also used in the management of angina pectoris and given to patients who have already a history of a myocardial infarction or heart attack. We will learn more about these drugs when we get to the review of cardiovascular diseases and cardiovascular drugs or medications that are taken to manage those diseases uh, in the next unit, in the next section. So the next video that you should watch uh, would be uh, on uh, cardiovascular uh, diseases and cardiovascular uh, drugs. So we'll see you in the next video.